Welcome everybody to Traction Thursday. Uh, we have an exciting presentation with Stuart Valentine. Before we launch, we'll quickly go around the room. Real quick introductions who you are, who you work for briefly, because as we get more and more crowded, we'll spend more time doing introductions and we will uh, actually have programming, but it's important that everybody knows who's in the room so that you can network afterwards and, and meet and chase people. And then after the presentation, we'll spend just uh, two or three quick minutes uh, Great community announcements that, that ought to be shared with the rest of the group. So that being said, we have are joined today by a couple of folks online. Uh, Bob, if you could facilitate their introduction. Okay. Gil, would you like to introduce yourself and then Sue? Oh, Gil Gillespie. I don't work. Uh, I only play. And I have the pleasure of working with Bob on the Iowa Food System Coalition's uh, Food System Plan farm, farm and Food Business Priority Group. I live in Atlantic, Iowa. Great. Great. I'm a former professor at Cornell University. So, uh, Sue and Ray. Oh, you're muted, Sue, I think. Okay. I'm Sue Sorensen. I'm the executive director of the Bell Center, which is a, we'll just call it an entrepreneurial center here in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, where the Iowa Wesleyan campus is located or was located. And we are in the uh, previous Chadwick Library of the campus. And we're building a community uh, supported ecosystem um, and co-op workspace and entrepreneurial center. So. Sounds great, thank you. Sir. Ray, Ray's here also. I'm Ray Venz. I am the uh, community manager here at the Bell Center uh, that does all the things that Sue just said. <laughs> It's great. If we ask you really nicely, maybe uh, you'll invite us to have a field trip over to the Bell Center one of these days. Done. We can do ah. that. Okay, uh, good. Mr. Ferguson. Hey, Bob Ferguson, uh, organizer, one of the organizers of the meeting, a uh, local business person and uh, local uh, civic guy. There you go. Galen. Uh, Galen Satterley, uh, co-owner of Breadtopia, the collective and the bakehouse, and I work for these people. <laughs> work with and for. I'll speak for both of us since she's chewing. Uh, Eric and Denise Rush started Breadtopia about 17 years ago. Fantastic. Allison Stimson, uh, I'm with Green Iowa AmeriCorps. Very good. We'll come in here. Hi, June, I'm uh, also with Green Iowa AmeriCorps with the, on the Resilient Action Committee working with the Sustainability Coordinator, Faith Reeves, and there's a few people here who are on tables there um, and working on um, coming up with uh, ways to create more of a zero waste culture and uh, community connecting culture here in Fairfield. That's great. That's awesome. Hi. Uh, employee at Pickle Creek Herbs and then a prospective silt farm farmer. <laughs> Mindy McAdams, I'm the executive director with the Early Chamber of Commerce. I'm Augustine Harless. Um, I have, I guess, many hats, but uh, the one I'm here entrepreneurially, I have an mo organic mobile soft serve business that I'm intending to scale up this coming. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Our best guy. Forward diving, but thanks for the cheers. <laughs> I'm with um, Mundo Lindo Farms and growing out a small, diverse farm into something larger. Awesome. Nice. I'm Jimmy Delver. I'm just detoxing from corporate life. I want that more civic project and funneling my Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it. Okay. Um, Published author, online course creator, editor, and I have some local projects I'm working on. That are and your name is? Oh, Phyllis Kerr. Jim Dollar, I am a all purpose entrepreneur. All purpose. <laughs> Jai. Jai Purdy, one of the partners of the Blue Rose Project and Hulu Kitchen. I'm Dennis Harwell, or Dennis James, for you to know me. Um, in addition to working for Eric and Denise here at Red Topia, I'm an independent performing songwriter. Wow, I like it. Excellent. Great. Uh, Big Reeves, local sustainability coordinator, local fruit grower, and uh, member of the SLT board, and uh, soil health consultant. I'm 
Getting bigger all the time. <laughs> yeah, really. Kevin Riley, I'm a designer, brand builder, and I'm on the board of the Fairfield Collab, where we'll have this traction Thursday next Thursday. Next Thursday, and I thought we had a collab on the square. Yeah. Donna, I'm starting a mushroom farm. Like it. Really? Yeah. Hi, Emily. I'm just here to learn and support Donna and her starting the farm. Everybody wants to work. Um, I know. Sorry, you just walked in. My name is Einer Olson. And I'm mainly interested right now in uh, planting native plants and getting ready for heaven on earth. <laughs> there you go. I like it. Well, welcome everybody to Traction Thursday. Without any further ado, I am going to I'm proud to introduce uh, Stuart Valentine, who uh, will en engage us with this lively conversation and information. So please let's give Stuart a warm. <laughs> A lively part depends on you. <laughs> uh, so I'm starting this as a kind of a spring it as a journey that is going to take our whole community to realize. But so here's the picture I wanted to present about uh, how we can go forward and, and really um, move this bottom-up entrepreneurial development into a thriving local economy. And I start out, why do I start a talk about, on entrepreneurship and community development with the Latinx? And it's simply to be contextualized and think of this as like the big nest that all of this is happening within. Entrepreneurship does not happen in isolation. It happens in the context of cosmology, philosophy, and community and spirit. So it, the labyrinths reflect humanity's drive for never-ending hero's quest, that is the role of the entrepreneur, for meaning, belonging, and becoming. And clearly, we're in a conversation of who do we want to be as a community, right? What is the full, most full expression we can envision and uh, realize for Fairfield? Uh, the labyrinth itself is an ancient tool designed to lead the individual through the journey of critical inner contemplation, which will show discuss in a minute, but that truly th we are inventing this whole idea out of pure consciousness. That's the foundation for this manifestation exercise of how to create what Charles Eisenstein said, that more beautiful world in our hearts and most possible. I love that statement mm -hmm. because it really is just been as if we are artists creating our own canvas. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, so how do we get there? You notice the first was why. The second is how do we get there? And the answer is we just we build a model that taps into a term that has driven the investment management that I do from, that started out in year 2000 um, <laughs> under the banner of Centered Wealth, which is what I call the sustainability made trends. This is, in my view, the next couple hundred years is going to see the unfolding sustainability regenerative future that must unfold if humanity is going to have a future on this planet. So what are those tailwinds? Uh, have any of you heard the term cultural creative? Yes. Long-term study from 1999 describing exactly all of us in this room. <laughs> have you heard the term LOHAS? Lifestyle of the health and sustainability marketplace. Also, formed and coined in late 90s. Uh, conscious capitalism is a term, a meaning that is widespread throughout the globe now. Um, and which of course Fairfield has a pretty important seed role to play in that conscious meaning that goes along with capitalism. And it builds off of the alphabet soup, socially responsible investing, environmental social governance screening, impact investing. This is the world that I live in on how to re-interpret in, uh, uh, the role of capital in growing that more beautiful world, moving beyond single bottom line profit first mandates into a triple bottom line. And I would argue beyond triple bottom line, we have to move into what I call the integral bottom line. That is harnessing the dynamic destiny path of each individual into the process. Uh, the other big mega trend, of course, is this climate thing. Whether I don't even care if it's real or not, the climate change uh, thesis forces us to rethink how we live on the planet. How well are we integrated into natural systems? 
Um, and to think of creative solutions through business on how we can mitigate uh, the acceleration of adverse climate change. Uh, we also, the mega trend of closed loop economy, which that term is clearly guiding most of the corporate development that I uh, pay attention to, the companies that I think are leading us into the 21st century, are looking how to close the loop on waste, how to uh, engineer through biomimetics uh, products that are drawing off of natural patterns and systems uh, so that we minimize our impact on them. And finally, you know, the role of technology in my estimation is, is yanking humans into a digital age. We had a very in-depth conversation yesterday, <laughs> Faith and uh, uh, June and, and Allison about this, about how do we restore community connections? Uh, and I believe we do that in large part through the way we design our businesses, which invites people into human activity. And then the alignment with natural systems, EBS stands for Ethical Biomimicry Finance, a model that I've been working with in terms of the investment frontier for some time now. Uh, so how, these are the, the drivers of how, and the way we do it is we create a model. And I'm just sharing with you the world I live in. Now, some of this is gonna be applicable to us, some of it's not so much. But this, every one of us, in my opinion, would be well served by building a personal model that grows out of what I would call your own unique dharmic destiny path. So the assignment is in 15 words or less, come up with your personal dharmic destiny path statement. And the value of that is it puts you into focus about where am I in this journey of life? So for me, this grew organically out of this 25 years of working in centered wealth. Yes, the consciousness is the field of all possibilities. I believe in that. I believe in uh, the universal infinite consciousness uh, experience that I have. I came out of it somewhere along the way. Conception happened, here I am. Um, and I went through, I've gone through and then going through the school of so-called hard knocks every day. The emotions that you know, came through this human body and experiences give rise to my beliefs. Every one of us have a very clear set of beliefs, whether we're conscious of those or not, you may be seen. I recommend as part of being a, a true, fully expressed adult, you really explore the beliefs that are driving your behavior. Give rise to your thoughts, give rise to the ethics and values. Now in my world, that translates into financial planning, life planning from a financial advisor, but I am very clear about the, my purpose of directing capital is to facilitate what I call the growing green economy. So we do rigorous uh, environmental, social, and governance screening, and we engage in shareholder activism with the companies that we invest in, in this public market sphere. Uh, impact investments, direct what I call relational investments with entrepreneurs philanthropy, renewable energy, organic agriculture, and what we're here to talk about this afternoon, morning, afternoon, is the community investment side. That's what Traction Thursday represents, is a bottom-up community investment dynamic that fully expressed, I would hope that Fairfield will sport a very effective community banking network, uh, a dual currency system that allows us greater uh, currency flows within the economy in Fairfield, more wealth, and we harness the technology that drives equity crowdfunding to fund our entrepreneurial community. So what are the steps we can take uh, to build what I call a community capital center? I, I think, you know, we have a banks, but banks are really very, um, in a highly regulated strata. There is a role for the banks as we know them today, but there's a vast gap between the entrepreneurial financing needs where we are at here in this group and when a, a, a traditional bank will step in. So the role of the community capital center is to fill that gap through uh, educational processes like this, bottom-up meetings, and the, the value of this is it builds a social network. We get a, a sense of who the community uh, members are that are interested in the entrepreneurial development process. Uh, 
the Capital Center creates ongoing uh, mentoring and forums, and CoLab is, you know it, CoLab is going to become the rock star of this whole action here <laughs> for Tracking Thursday because we need kind of a, a structure and definition for engagement to allow individuals from, you know, literally, I can imagine high schools having classes at the CoLab high school students, for example, getting indoctrinated, if you will, you think of it that way, uh, indoctrinated <laughs> into the possibilities surrounding entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial development. And of course, we have our regional partner in the form of Alice in Uboco. Nita is right there at our side, an existing structure to support this. Uh, and Kelly's not here today, but already we have the educational framework in Indian Hills to support entrepreneurial development, business plan writing, et cetera. And importantly, these are all, I think, future grant chances. I think we have a really strong case uh, to the rural economic development idea for submitting grants to support this process. And then uh, one of that one of the big gaps between our local banks and where we were at is jumpstart capital, early stage, high risk, angel oriented capital to help the ideas that are at the table right here today get going. And uh, any of you heard of slow food? Have you heard of slow money? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Some well, people, some of us have more experience than others, right? He was one of the early socially responsible investment luminaries in the 80s and 90s. And when he started the slow money movement, that gave rise to uh, a model for the local lending club, which is interesting because regulations are something I have to pay quite close attention to. And lo and behold, I can participate in a local lending club as a licensed financial advisor, as long as it's an active membership club. And I see the role of uh, many in our community having the ability to once every quarter sit down, everybody pitches in whatever amount of money they're willing to put at risk. And we have a process by which we act like a community bank. Right, but for early stage high risk loans, because early stage is early stage, sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. But the idea is if we can do enough mentoring and support and facilitation to the early stage businesses, as those loans get paid back, we get to get to do it again, and we got jump start capability right now. It's friends and family, which is an important first start. There's no question that probably will still be in the picture. But we need another layer beyond friends and family that I'll call jumpstart capital. So that idea takes a champion, and I'm willing to play that one. I'm, I'm willing to set about calling up the people I think are in a position to play that role. And uh, with the support of the co lab and the forums and the mentoring and the teaching. I think we have a shot at growing some really good businesses in Fairfield. Uh, in fact, this is nothing new. I mean, Jim, what was your Magnetics Research International, right? Was that the company? Yeah, name? Global. Global. Yeah. I mean, this entrepreneur story, we're just standing on shoulders of those who've gone before us. We're just continuing this process. And then, of course, the other role that this community capital center can do is networking with other entrepreneur and entrepreneur investor networks. PIN stands for private investor network, which I'll describe in a minute here. Um, I'm tapped into these kinds of networks. There are vast resources that if we can get ourselves into focus, uh, we can participate in a much broader context than just the, the Fairfield Iowa, even though that is our focus. There are many resources that we can uh, collaborate with and share ideas with, cross-pollinate with any of the biomimetic um, ideas. And then finally, you know, that big nest uh, of the labyrinth, uh, well, uh, Ann Walton and the, the Sierra Club work, work is providing us a very big context. And the, the Regenerative Action Committee work that's underway for the last year and of course, FACE is positioned as the coordinator at the city level to facilitate that process. 
you know, we have a lot of momentum going. And I think we just have to help um, our business community and our community at large realize that investing in Fairfield through this process, I think will deliver long-term returns to our community and attract people to come work and live here. All right, so that's the what. Um, so the destination starts with community-wide bottom-up assessment. That's underway. Kellen's doing the assessment for the Southeast Side right. Food Web. Kellen's here with us now. Oh, hi, Kellen. Hello. Yeah, because you got it, you got sort of before you can have a map and say you are here, we need to know what that here looks like. Okay. So getting a sense of our regional uh, entrepreneurial resources, our business. Uh, businesses that are working in this case uh, in the food area is important. Um, and oh, that's interesting. Well, nothing like technology. I have a whole lot more to say. Maybe they're a little bit later. Right? Left arrow? Left arrow. Okay, but I was. There no, I'm missing a whole series oh, of bullet so points. Try the right arrow key. No, okay. Well, down. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I can just make it up. It's called improv. You got it. Uh, so the the concept is, you know, this this, this uh, you may have heard the term place making. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. We're we're all doing it all the time. Uh, I'm invested in a company called In Place Impact, which is uh, working with larger cities uh, to engage just this process like we're involved with now, only that typically starts with a university anchor that has got an entrepreneurial program going. It gets into the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it goes to the city council and the county supervisors. It's basically what we're doing here, just typically in a larger urban setting, uh, to again, this drives the economic development of the location. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the um, right here, and you'll get this in an email. This is a talk some of you may have seen last Earth Day. I did uh, out at the fairgrounds on in place in fact and what that little list i was going to go through talks about all the constituent elements that go into this bottom-up push uh, for making the networks and the systems in place that create you know this robust uh entrepreneurial ecosystem we're talking about um there are uh yeah. the i mentioned private investor network um this is the owner of the broker dealer that I work with is named Steve Bustante. He and I have been working for the last seven years thinking about how to integrate the financial advisor world with the entrepreneurial world. And he, bless his soul, has produced uh, two books uh, in this regard. One, yeah, I'll just pass them out. Yeah. Oh, so, they want to show. Uh, oh, yeah. One is uh, really quite fun. It's built off of the Aesop Fables idea. Um, Entrepreneur Land. Uh, I don't know if I brought enough. I do have some more. But uh, so share them where you have mutual shares the options. And I can bring more. But uh, I, here's what I recommend yeah, for a very light, yeah. fun yeah. weekend read. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, you start with entrepreneur land and pitchology is a much more kind of higher level approach to entrepreneurship and raising capital uh, how to build that business model um, to the point where you're able to actually stand in front of your funders and again in this room for example we have entrepreneurs and we have entrepreneur investors. So we are a community together and, and the key is going to build that community side by side. So we have a job to do. It's not just getting the entrepreneurs tooled up. We actually have to uh, wake up and organize the entrepreneur investor within Fairfield at the same time. And for that, you know, the community forum idea, the discussions, the presentations, uh, and this is going to be the collab. The role of the collab will be to develop ongoing curriculum 
and opportunities for both entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial investors to come in and learn of, about what each other are up to and what their concerns are. Uh, the Entrepreneur Land book does a really good job of putting you into the role of entrepreneurial investor and into the role of entrepreneur. And so you get a sense of the two sides of the equation. Um, so on that note, let's see what else. Uh, this, uh, I would just say that part of being an entrepreneur, you know, eventually, I would say, even at the outset, you are actually taking on a leadership role within your niche, whatever that might be, the business you're contemplating. And uh, Barrett Brown, who I met through the whole integral theory uh, world, um, yeah, if you're ever interested in midnight studies, study Ken Wilber's integral theory. And it's, it's amazing how robust the business consulting community is that has grown out of integral theory. Mm -hmm. Barrett Brown is just an amazingly uh, bright individual. He, he wrote this for John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods. And it's a really, uh, I think, especially good uh, summary and description of the world we're growing into and what leadership looks like in the 21st century. And then Bob and I have done a video, thanks to uh, Werner Elkmer, on uh, enhancing local food systems and the entrepreneurial roles and socially responsible investing. Uh, all under the umbrella of the work we have all done under the, the Sustainable Living Coalition. So this will get emailed over to you, and if you find yourself with time, uh, there'll be good sort of enhancements to this. So on that note, I think I am done with the presentation part and open it up to questions and thoughts. <laughs> Can can actually Don, I think I you're you're well, that first one up. It might be a silly question and you might have already uh you might have already answered it, but um I'm a little slow today, so um I guess I'll just ask um what is shareholder activism? So when you're when you buy a stock in a company uh on the public market, you are the owner. Uh now we have this many of us don't recognize that we're the owner. All that management, you know, like Jamie Dimon, the king of banking at J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. Jamie works for me if I own that stock. Mm -hmm. And our role as owners is to engage as owners uh, with respect to policies and vision and future strategic planning. So there's a whole slew of funds that have grown up in the last 40 years that actually take that role seriously. And uh, traditionally, or if you, every, every big money player does engage in some way or another with shareholder activism. But the common mutual fund owner who has their 401k over here and doesn't know what it, what's happening with it are pretty oblivious to that. Well, that is no longer needed. If you want to participate, you can actively engage in shareholder activism. That might be uh, working to introduce a policy change with the company and build a coalition of other owners to put it to shareholder votes. Uh, so this is the uh, modern technology is allowing this to come down to the individual investor much more effectively. Is there some kind of app that lets you track what your, what your businesses that you invest yeah, although are doing? Yeah, there is. And so you can go, uh, if you want to mentally write this down, as you sow, you're, you're in the whole template. But mm -hmm. I don't want to take up a lot of our time here talking about shareholder activism. Mm -hmm. I will. There is one dimension that I didn't cover here that I want to summarize. This uh, progression, communion, communication, commitment, community growth, as well. You know, the interesting thing about the Fairfield experiment is that, you know, the experiment was launched on the big, big idea, you know, come to Fairfield, bring your families, grow your businesses, come to the domes, where we will uh, basically meditate, meditate, <laughs> <laughs> okay. meditate, meditate together, uh, you know, to, to create an ideal society and usher in the descent of heaven and earth, right? Now, 
so you're sitting in the dome with a thousand or fifteen hundred people in those days, and you're like, ideal society, how does that work? How does that work? Well, the way it works, in my experience, is that it wakes up a quality of internal communication within yourself that brings you into focus about what you really care about and what's the, the highest potential for this life, right? So I, that communication is essential, that internal dialogue, because of the principle, again, largely throughout, birds of a feather flock together, right? So the moment you start speaking out the direction that you're really interested in, lo and behold, other people show up that share that vision or values. And Fairfield is a wonderfully interesting magnetic melting pot of uh, communications, if you will, and uh, individuals who have clarity about what they're up to. Um, those uh, um, people, this is a great example. We are coming together with a shared interest of growing entrepreneurial businesses and bringing a more robust economy into Fairfield. That leads to commitments. Um, you know, for example, I think uh, the time is right for starting a local lending club. Well, guess what? That involves agreements, contracts, structure, the whole thing. Or, you know, on your mushroom farm, you're going to have to decide, am I an LLC? Am I a sole proprietorship? That involves contracts, commitments. You're going to hire people, right? So commitments are, are the thinking of it like threads weaving our community asset quilt together to borrow from Kurt Chimofsky and others asset, community asset quilt. Um, that actually is what gives shape and structure to our community. And actually, in, in my estimation, the whole big reason of why we do anything is to create a healthy, robust community that we can play in. <laughs> that, and, and that we can eat great food in, right? And have great dancing. And what, I mean, you know, the bottom line is how do we throw a better party? And how do we afford to throw a better party? It means we have to be engaged in some form of income generation. And hopefully that's a business that you yourself control. When I think of people's concerns, because I work with investors of all types, but I, I notice a very interesting process. Often, the more money an individual has, the more worried they are about losing. And I, I keep saying, well, if you're worried about you know, the end of the world as we know it, which pretty much every one of us has an imagination, and I, pick your one. There's something out there you're worried about. <laughs> Most of the time, that worry can be alleviated if you were in uh, control and managed your own business. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the uncertainty, now, now the world shifts a little bit. You're, you're actually driving the car. You're not at the mercy of an employer or at the mercy mm -hmm. of some outward force. Although, let me tell you, well, COVID, <laughs> COVID was an outside <laughs> force. Well, yeah. It just so happened, <laughs> luck of the draw, right? It could have wiped you guys out like that. Same with me. It was like our business took off. And I'm sitting there watching others who were, you know, for no fault of their own whatsoever. Just the circumstance, that was it. Boom. So I guess I could say it's not a guarantee, but it is a good way to um, uh, get up every morning feeling a little bit more stable if you have your own business. Now, Jim, when he talks, he'll talk about how many years did you run Creative Edge? And, and probably about 28 of them, you got up every day wondering whether it was going to survive the next month, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, but I'm still saying that there's a, there's a big pot of fruit, in my estimation, at running your own business. And again, I speak from my own experience for doing this for you know, before I was centered wealth, and how how that's open, I was crown future. So we've been on the line since 1989. So it's like 30, you know, 35 years of that, and it hasn't always been easy. But I I work with people of all types, and I would not want to trade seats with the the many of the situations that I have to help advise. So that's my call to action for the very angry. Uh, yeah. How um how can or does our community um, help support entrepreneurs who are risking everything with trying to start a business that may or may not collapse? Like I think I've heard only 
ten percent of restaurants succeed after the first three years or become profitable? Yeah. Or, you know. Well, I would say, and this goes back to Kellen, who's online. You should, you've got to do a feasibility assessment before you start a business. And and I'll speak to my own experience. I grew up in the restaurant business. The first three months of the uh, the MBA here in Fairfield were torturous for me because I was uh, I am entrepreneurially at heart. So the first three months of the MBA were all about corporate management. I had to come to work with a suit and tie. <laughs> I uh, and so I thought I'm 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 not going to and I'm borrowing every nickel. I got to cut this out. What do I know how to do? I know how to run a restaurant, a particular type of restaurant. So I used that three months to do a feasibility study. What did I learn in 1984? There's about this much money in Fairfield to spend on going out to eat. And what do I know how to do? High end gourmet, you know, premium stuff, not feasible. So a big part about being an entrepreneur is doing the front end feasibility assessment about just how risky is this business proposition? So that's the role of us. It's the role of the collab and the engagement and support network that I believe we are building right now so that entrepreneurs, when they do decide to make that commitment, they have a good sense of what the risk actually is. Yeah. Uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned local currencies. Uh, yeah, right here. Uh, okay. Union currencies. Union currencies. Uh, can you just talk about that? Or yeah. So in 2010, uh, I was teaching a class on sustainable investing in the MBA program, and uh, a student, Scott Morris, uh, picked up on this theme and was totally into it. He's still involved. In this. He's out in the community world. Uh, and through my network, uh, the guy, Joel Hadroff, who we created what's called a dual currency. Now, this is a totally different presentation, but suffice to say that it uh, builds off of the spirit of generosity and volunteerism by rewarding that activity through an integrated model between uh, community participants and a centralized volunteer center. So you expand the money supply by generating credits. You still have the dollar just like we do now, but uh, it expands on the local money supply through the regular routine of volunteer activity that we already do. And not only that, it, it enhances the incentive to participate in volunteer activity, the community activity. Uh, so it bears, it, you know, there's a big discussion about how that works and but again, it's um it's the existing model. It, it's just a matter of us building the coalition to implement. Do, do you mean you use your volunteer hours become currency? Correct. <laughs> not, no, it's not a barter system at all. It, 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 the, the unique innovation is is that the uh, our community itself, whether it's the public institutions like uh, uh, the Sondheim Center or the Recreation Center or private businesses like Redtopia's Cafe, um, uh, service businesses like Center of Wealth, uh, we basically, uh, in support of enhancing the thrivability, the economic vitality of Fairfield, we put up our own promotions around this. And the goal of a community currency is to fill the gaps of surplus capacity. So, for example, the cafe between uh, two to five p.m. is if you if you were open for those hours, you know you have your lunch rush, but then you have your downtime until dinner comes. Well, you could set up uh, promotions and incentives during the downtime so that people who have this community currency could come in and get. Uh, that you would not be making the same profit margin, right? But you would still be making a profit. And when it comes to paying, you know, hourly wages and whatnot to employees, having cash flow is important. Yeah. So it it um, uh, surplus capacity. It, it basically creates more demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the thing airline miles. Why do they offer airline miles? Because they have unused seats, and that you know. So it really is a way of sopping up excess capacity 
where the entrepreneur or the business gets their recovers their cost and maybe a little bit, not as much, but they're still recovering some cost. Now, and it, and it's creating more of a of a flow within the community. Yeah, the reason this uh, did a six month trial in 2010, and we 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 have the full case study written up. The reason it hasn't it's still on the shelf is because it does require a full time administrator, and that requires a budget. And so that either comes through the merchant participants, the community itself, or it's uh, the grant funded, or it's woven into the existing library budget or something of that sort. And that puzzle has not been solved yet. Yeah. And anybody else? Now you have one of the. I don't understand the answer that you gave, so I was just going to clarify, ask a clarifying question. Okay. Um, so <laughs> what didn't you understand? Well, um, so does does that mean that Redtopia offers uh, a lower price on? Uh, no, you you have your currency unit because you helped. Uh, maybe you went out and worked in the community garden, or, or even better, you helped. Uh, and this is right here, right now. You helped Abu Togo go tr uh, prune the community orchard in Chautauqua. Okay, that's a big job right here, right? He's now. not going to be doing it right yeah, now. Yeah, he just had a baby, right? Okay, but you go down and spend uh, two hours on a Saturday afternoon wow. doing that kind of activity, let's say. You earn you earn your, uh, we call it merit. You earn merit. Uh, you you come into, say the merit is worth $10 a merit. And this, this all has to be finance. Uh, and instead of paying, um, you know, ten dollars for the burrito bowl, right. you get uh, if you use a merit, you get the burrito bowl and uh, two drinks for free. Oh. Some some incentive to use this currency, okay. no. and and hopefully the incentives are good enough that you would you would move in to uh, having lunch at Redtopia. Because you have enough extra currency, because you've engaged in supporting the community like this, where before you may not have done so, um, or an excess theater seat at, at the Sondheim. Mm -hmm. One ticket's thirty-five bucks. Sondheim's got a hundred seats that are empty. Buy, bring in a merit, you can get pay for one, get one free. Mm -hmm. That'd be a high value of your merit. Mm -hmm. That'd be thirty-five bucks. Mm -hmm. but, so again, it's it's about the the merchant community and the uh, uh, public services uh, being educated on how these merits work, and they get to decide at what point, you know, at what level of incentive they would like to give to this. But what it means for us is that people who are unemployed or underemployed or retirees who are looking just to engage, we now have within the community an organized uh, process where online you can find out everything that's going on with churches and schools and uh, the city and even private businesses that are sponsoring uh, community activities that are for the betterment of the community. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to participate in those, you get rewarded with merits, which in turn you get to use in the marketplace. So it's what's called a dual currency. All, all we're trying to do here is right now, the US dollar currency pool looks like this. Well, with an active dual currency, you expand it to this. More purchasing power, more economic activity. We talk about thriving economic vitality. This is one way I think that we could do that. <clears throat> Stuart, give us a um, maybe a starting point where in the next couple of two or three or four months, uh, what would we do to get this thing going? Yeah, okay. Well, I think um, uh, one is that the collab has the natural seat for this uh, conversation. So we need to work with the collab to design the engagements beyond Traction Thursday. And, you know, I, I see that. Part of these types of this, you could think of this as being like a class, right? How do we expose the community to, you know, deeper understanding of how to um, spawn entrepreneurial activity? Uh, and with that that setting of the collab, um, we 
provide resources, right? We could even, I mean, we could just borrow probably from Indian Hills some of their curriculum, right? So that this, this activity right here could get uh, furthered by evening classes on, like, for example, Donna, have you written a business plan yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, but you know that's out there, right? Right. Yeah. So you're getting your ducks organized in a row. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see that we have the opportunity to facilitate and accelerate that process mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. so that you can come to a conclusion of whether this thing actually flies or not. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a big part of the challenge for an individual entrepreneur just getting started, you know, especially if you haven't gone through business school or you don't have a, a sense of reference about where uh, to start and what the steps of progress look like. Now, I would say these two books, in my estimation, they'll get you there. But just reading a book is not enough. But first of all, it's not so much fun. <laughs> it is much more fun in my room. Uh, I, I just think maybe in the new digital age, people would go on it. But ultimately, I think people to people is going to facilitate and accelerate the process. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, that's one answer. Um, I could see a need for um, people already engaged in their own businesses and to, to a need for um, more advice, you know, solving problems that they didn't realize would come up. Um, you know, we've hit this wall. What What is this looking like? Yeah. What do I do about it? Yeah. Um, that would also be a really good thing to offer. Well, I, I think you could even describe that as peer group learning, right? <laughs> Maybe, in fact, I, I haven't thought of this until now, but bingo, Mendy's here, head of the chamber. The chamber could begin uh, just, you know, an informal, again, make it fun, make it easy, informal people where people come together and share their experiences and challenges. Uh, because my guess is, you know, like, I've already seen it here in this networking where people say, uh, this occurred for um, uh, Michael when he presented last yep. week. I happen to know that Tom Cat Ranch out in California, you know, uh, Tom Steyer and Cat mm -hmm. Taylor um, is, a, is a regenerative organic research event that's over 10 years. It's an absolute data gold mine for the potential of Michael's business, what he needs in terms of data, for example. So by virtue of that kind of peer group learning, if it's some kind of regular monthly or something setting, then you know these types of communication and commitment steps happen more easily. Mm -hmm. Again, can't make it. I don't know how the rest of you are, but aren't we all feeling pretty overloaded with opportunities for just getting through my email in a day? Is is rather radical. It's, it's nice. And then you want me to go leave my house at five o'clock <laughs> or eight o'clock or whatever to do it all over again? So we have to figure out what the right rhythm to this is and how to make it easier and fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Let's give him another round. <laughs> oh, there, there is a second answer, real quick. Uh, it's the local Indian club. Because if, without jumpstart capital, although capital is the last thing in the process, right. nobody's going to lend any money until I really am sure that you've got it figured out enough to convince me that it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of steps between then and the local lending club, but those two pieces are important. Mm -hmm. So it's a great segue, actually. Uh, last week, uh, Mendy and, and Kelly Burkett had a meeting to discuss an, an entrepreneur day. And the goal here for New Boco, why I be part of the reason I'm here with some grant funding to establish this entrepreneurial club, put another one in, in Mount Pleasant and another one in Burlington. And you get these going concurrently. And then once every quarter, yeah. we have an entrepreneur day here and maybe do one over in the Bell Center over in Mount Pleasant for another quarter, where collectively the Southeast Iowa region will network with other entrepreneurs because it is a team sport. Yeah, uh, entrepreneurs are actually your best resources because I suspect 
you've skinned your knees a few times starting a business or two. <laughs> you would warn a few of us not to do, don't play with matches around that gas tank, Alex. It's a bad idea. It's like, oh, I didn't even think about that. You're a genius, right? <laughs> so trying to give you opportunities and platforms to, to meet with and work with other entrepreneurs. That I know Faith and Kevin are, have done some networking with other entrepreneurs and we're getting there. It's, it's incremental steps. And you mentioned uh, local funding. Um, in a couple of weeks on May 21st or May 21st or March 21st. March 21st. March 21st. Uh, Caitlin Byers uh, from Kiva, Iowa, it's a micro lending mm -hmm. organization, uh, no interest, will be here to speak alongside Kelly Prickett, who's your local SBDC person. That's small business loans. They are going to be speaking here to talk about how do you fund your startup? What are some of the options that you have? In addition to those traditional micro loan, and then you've got your you know, small business loan, there's, there are grant funds available as well. And New Belt Co. is an engine subsidized by the state. Help teach these skills and help build these micro communities in entrepreneurialism so that we can grow our own. And these resources are there, but most of us, when we start a business, don't even know where to go. And to Denise's point, where do I go if this brain sort of, if I've reached this point in our job? Feel free to reach out. You know, Stuart has resources, Bob has resources, Mandy has tons of resources through the chamber. But the first most important thing is you have to just let your, keep, park your ego at the door and ask for help. Because their resources are there, but if you don't ask for help, you can't you do you, a lot of work for yourself to try to do it yourself um and certainly reach out to me if you ever have questions and i'll get you in touch with the right people in your own community to do well, you represent a statewide funding network i mean you're plugged into iowa angels and bc so this is the the progression we're in just the first inning right. of this game but if we get the developmental process right and get the sophistication of the ideas right eventually Alex is going to be a really important connector uh, to statewide resources. Exactly. Yeah. That's sort of the goal. We build the local here. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're at that wonderful point of our uh, day today to talk a little bit about community announcements. Tonight is Business After Hours at First Resources from 4 to 6. Um, on April 16th, FIDA, the Chamber in Indian Hills, will be partnering uh, to do a lunch and learn on state small business credit initiative. Um, it does have some money for startups. It has some money for small businesses. Um, I don't really know what it is, but there's an expert coming to talk about it because I don't know what it is. Um, and then in July, we are going to have an entrepreneurial day. Um, it'll be in an eight to four kind of day. Um, we'll talk about everything from am I an S Corp, a C Corp, an LLC, to taxes, to finances, to all kinds of fun things. Um, and we have some fun speakers for that. So. And you have a watch party coming. Yes, and we have a watch party. Is that next? Um, Indian Hills does um, a coffee break uh, for a variety, and the next one is about Instagram, and it's from 9 to 10 in my office. I always have donuts and coffee, so um, if you don't want to watch it at home by yourself, you can come watch it with me, and then we talk about it afterwards, and we have all kinds of fun. So, uh, if you're looking for a chamber e-newsletter, go to fearfulliowa.com, scroll down halfway, and subscribe to the e-newsletter, and you won't miss any. Any questions for Mandy? She'll be around just for a little bit afterwards, and hang in there, and get more information. <laughs> Uh, Kevin, anything from the collab? Well, uh, if you don't know anything about it, or if you would like to bring somebody with you, please come next week. This event will be held there next week, probably just one time, or maybe hopefully other times in the future. But uh, it's a great space to move, uh, move around, and have freedom to work and develop ideas. And we encourage all kinds of people to house to use the space. And Stuarts and, and Alex have great ideas about that. Yeah, we just raided your home. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm really excited for everything that's coming up. It's the old Iowa State Bank building on the square. Mm -hmm. So, so are we going to be at lunch or evening? What do you? Next do Thursday at this time, we're moving this, this meeting to the collab next week. Right. Just to follow on later in the day, you have. Uh, yeah, that uh, evening we're doing a happy hour. This is something we used to do every month uh, in our old location. We haven't fired it up since we moved. And our featured guest this week is um, Grove Fairfield. Yeah, right. We always have some feature, some focus right. of okay. each one of these happy hour events. Okay. We'll find space. Or we'll maybe just do a little quick tour and then we'll have a big kind of an open space yeah. in the lobby where we can all yeah. sit 
Yeah. And if it was a smaller group, we'd be in there. Our new kitchen has a sink now. So okay. I have I have one other ask. Okay. Uh this is I guess this has been part of an announcement, but um many of you got Bob's invitation to uh vote for the Lebanon vote. I put this out to Steve Gastante and uh, he tapped his private investor network, uh, which is mostly East Coast, and they got 50 votes in an hour. So this is the power of harnessing the power of networks. So we got lickety split uh, hit our target, thanks to a guy who lives in Woodbury, New York, who is excited about this. But these two books that you have, if when, when you finish reading them, if you read them, uh, Steve would request if you or want to to just uh, do a review on that. Great. So I'm going to leave that there. Well, you can send that to me and I'll post it. Oh, uh, okay. They just send, send electronically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we have any announcements in Mount Pleasant, Sue? Right? Yes. Are you muted? So muted. Um, specific announcement it is Chicken Day at the Grange Public House and Brewery, my other home. Uh -huh. Lots of stuff coming up, though. So keep um, I will keep everybody informed. We've got a, a pitch competition that's coming up pretty soon. And we've got a, what we're calling a founder summit that may be happening in June. And, of course, RAGBRAI is coming through Mount Pleasant in July. So we've got a lot going on. Yep. Don't you have a Nuboco-led uh, pitch competition? That's what, that's what Sue's talking about. But that's September, right? That's uh, August, but it's the same same pitch competition. We're, we're just getting it organized, right? So that could be a goal for us. Let's see if we have uh, we can grow a, a, a participant. Uh, absolutely, you'll get plenty of participants from Fairfield. They're all welcome. Mm -hmm. all right. Any other announcements? Going once, going twice. Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. We'll see you all next time.